There were hundreds of Muslim prisoners being held in Guantanamo Bay. But that also we had in Guantanamo Bay our U.S. Army Muslim chaplain. And that, perhaps, would be an indication to the world, to the international community, that the United States was treating these prisoners in Guantanamo Bay humanely. I was disturbed by these many, many things that was going on. I was disturbed how prisoners were being held in cage-like cells, being treated more like animals. Animal. Animal. More extreme measures of protest occurred when it was learned by prisoners that the Qurans were being taken into the interrogation room. And as a Muslim prisoner sat shackled in his chair at the wrist, waist, and ankles, an interrogator would take the Quran and slam it in front of him on the floor, stamp on it, kick it, even sit on it. Later, there were investigations that were carried out into abuses towards the Holy Quran conducted by the U.S. military itself. And they revealed that even the Holy Quran was at times urinated on by U.S. personnel. But the prisoners protested and it became chaotic inside the prison cell blocks for the guards, for the intelligence interrogators, for everyone. It wasn't long before personnel in Guantanamo leadership even came to me, the chaplain, the Muslim chaplain in Guantanamo, to try and help solve this problem, which the U.S. military themselves caused by desecrating the Quran. But that was one way in which religion was being used as a weapon. Personnel in Guantanamo recognized that we as Muslims, we revere the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We put the Quran on the highest shelf in our home. We never place the Quran somewhere that's filthy or dirty. We never put the Quran under our chair because we would never sit over the Quran. U.S. personnel recognized how we as Muslims treat the Quran and respect it and tried to use that to exploit that respect for the words of Allah to try and break the prisoner. That was just one example of how religion was being used as a weapon in Guantanamo Bay. Let me explain to you another way in which religion was being used as a weapon against these prisoners in the interrogation operation. There were both male and female interrogators and the interrogation operation was very competitive. The U.S. Secretary of Defense was putting enormous amount of pressure on intelligence gathering in Guantanamo Bay to get information from these quote suspected terrorists. So it was very competitive. But the women in Guantanamo, the female interrogators, they felt that maybe they had an advantage over their male counterparts. And what was that advantage? Their gender, their sexuality. Some of those female interrogators were very ready to go into an interrogation room where that Muslim male prisoner sat shackled. And she would strip off her own clothes, stand naked in front of a Muslim prisoner, knowing that perhaps that prisoner came from a conservative Muslim society where men and women perhaps don't even shake hands. U.S. personnel understood the culture of Islam, the separation that we find even in this room where we have the men sitting in one section and the women in another. U.S. personnel would exploit this part of Muslim culture in order to try and break the prisoners down. Again, investigations were later conducted into abuses of prisoners in Guantanamo. And they reveal how some of these women interrogators inappropriately rubbed their own bodies on these Muslim prisoners as they couldn't resist being shackled in their chairs. Some of them even went so far as grabbing the genitals of male prisoners in Guantanamo while they were being interrogated. Again, here, religion is being used as a weapon, something that disturbed me, 
to the core of my soul and bone. Let me explain to you in detail a third way in which religion was being used as a weapon in Guantanamo. One of the prisoners would describe for me an interrogation room. As a chaplain, I was assigned to the detention operation, far removed from the intelligence gathering operation. It would be unethical for a chaplain of any faith, of any religion, of any denomination to assist interrogators in gaining information or intelligence from prisoners that were being held. So I was assigned to the guard force. But one of the prisoners in my interaction with him would describe for me this interrogation room. He said that in this interrogation room, there was a large circle that was on the ground, marked on the ground, a large circle. And inside this circle was another symbol. It was a symbol that represented shaitan, Satan. And the interrogators would take the Muslim prisoner shackled, force him in the center of this satanic circle, and attempt to force that Muslim prisoner to bow down and prostrate, to make sujood, to make rukul in the center of this satanic circle while that interrogator screamed at this Muslim that Satan is your God now, not Allah. They were attacking these Muslims because they believed in Allah and they understood in Guantanamo the core belief of our faith that we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we believe in the oneness, the uniqueness of Allah azza wa jal. And they persecuted these Muslims in Guantanamo for belief in Tawheed. This is how religion was being used as a weapon. But along with that, there were many other ways in which religion was used to exploit the situation in Guantanamo. There were times when Muslims in Guantanamo had their beards forcefully shaven as punishment. There were times when guards would intentionally turn the water off before the prayer time, before Salah, so prisoners couldn't make wudu or perform wudu and pray before and wash before prayer. There were times when interrogation sessions lasted so long that Muslim prisoners shackled in chains could not make their salah. There were times when interrogators dressed themselves up as Catholic priests and would conduct a mock baptism of a Muslim prisoner, telling that prisoner that he was now baptized in the faith of Christianity and was no longer a Muslim. This is religious persecution, something which goes against the fundamental values of human rights, something which goes against even the Constitution of the United States, something which goes against our belief in Islam, which upholds justice and protects human rights. I was disturbed by these many, many things that was going on. I was disturbed how prisoners were being held in cage-like cells, being treated more like animals. I was disturbed even by the ages of some of the prisoners in Guantanamo, especially those who I came across that were as young as 12 years old. There were 12-year-old boys in Guantanamo being held by the U.S. military and were being characterized as suspected terrorists. I would raise concerns about these issues, bring forth the complaints of the prisoners to the chain of command, to the higher levels of leadership, knowing the words of our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who said that if someone sees an evil, he should change it with his hand. And if he can't change it with his hand, then he should change it with his tongue. That means speak out against these injustices. As a chaplain, it was my duty, it was my obligation to raise issue, to raise concern about abuse of prisoners in Guantanamo Bay. It was my obligation as a Muslim. It was my obligation as a U.S. citizen to raise concerns about abuses that were taking place in Guantanamo Bay. At first, I actually believed 
that when I brought forth much of this information, it was being valued by my superiors, my supervisors. They gave me awards down in Guantanamo, signed by the commanding general. I received a stellar officer evaluation report, the best that I had ever received in my 14 years as an officer in the United States Army. I felt that my input was being recognized, was being valued by the chain of command in Guantanamo. Because then I would receive what's known as R&R. R&R in the military means rest and relaxation. It means that you can sent home for two weeks to visit your family and see them, but then you have to return to your military mission. I got R&R, &R, and I got on a plane from Guantanamo Bay which would land in Jacksonville, Florida. I had another flight to catch from Jacksonville, Florida to Seattle, Washington, where I would meet my wife and daughter, who I hadn't seen for 10 months at least. But I never made that second flight from Florida to Seattle, Washington. Because when the plane landed from Guantanamo into Florida State at the Jacksonville Naval Air Station, I was met by people customs and immigration officials who would want to search my bags and backpack and then they would make claims that I was carrying what they called suspicious documents and then all of a sudden there were intelligence officers army counterintelligence naval criminal investigators the FBI was there and they would say that I was carrying classified documents and they got an arrest warrant and they arrested me in secret. Nobody knew I had gotten arrested. I never made that flight to get back home. My wife and daughter had no idea what happened. I never showed up. My wife was worried. She would call my parents in New Jersey, asking to see if they had heard from me. My parents didn't hear anything. Nobody knew where I was. It was like I had disappeared in America, but I was sitting in prison. I was sitting in a maximum security prison on lockdown and I was being accused by my own government of spying, espionage, aiding the enemy, aiding the terrorist enemy and I was even threatened with the death penalty. Adopt. The most important thing in our deen is aqeedah. Teachings to implement. Second to that is morals. Principles to pursue. There are several reasons why do kids lie. Here to execute the doctrines of Islam to make every move successful. A visitor at home every Sunday at 5.30 p.m. Saudi Arabia and 6.30 p.m. UAE on Peace TV. Where truth is hidden, misleading quotations create confusion. Where truth is hidden, lack of knowledge and wisdom cause upheaval and commotion. Where truth is hidden, manipulated scriptures and twisted facts emerge. This very hidden truth creates false propaganda, mayhem, chaos, disorder, and turmoil in our lives and the world order. But is there anyone with courage and wisdom? What is the truth and who has the courage to expose it? Because it's your right to know the truth. Watch Truth Prevail and Lies Perish in Truth Exposed by Dr. Zakir Naik, next on Peace TV. I was held in jail, initially incommunicado, which means I wasn't allowed to contact anyone, so nobody knew where I was. But my family learned of where I was 
about 10 days later when they saw me on the news, on television, when the news of the day in September of 2003 was that the U.S. Army Muslim chaplain, Captain Yi, had been arrested and was being accused of these heinous crimes. Yes, I was sitting in this maximum security prison. And when they transferred me from Jacksonville, Florida to South Carolina in this military naval brig, they threw me in the back of this truck next to an armed guard. Two of the armed guards in the front, the armed guard next to me, would take out of his bag these goggles, blackened out plastic goggles, and he put them over my eyes so I couldn't see anything. He took out of his bag these ear devices that go over the ears so I couldn't hear anything. I was shackled at the wrist and at the waist, at the ankles, just like prisoners in Guantanamo are shackled. I was being subjected to something which is known as sensory deprivation. Sensory deprivation. I was subjected to this very same technique that was being used on prisoners in Guantanamo Bay. Something which I observed from being down in Guantanamo as the Muslim chaplain. And I feared that my own government would strip from me all of my rights, all of my civil liberties, all of my human rights, as I understood that the Bush administration had declared that Geneva Conventions did not apply down in Guantanamo, and that prisoners in Guantanamo didn't have rights. I feared that my own government would strip from me, even as a U.S. citizen, my own rights. I was thrown in that prison for 76 days. After 76 days and being accused of these awful crimes, being threatened with the death penalty, I was suddenly released. But the U.S. military still tried to put me in prison for lesser offenses. They wanted to charge me with what they called mishandling classified information. But that would mean they would have to show that I was carrying some classified information. But indeed, the facts were was that I had nothing. And all charges, all accusations against me were dropped and I was released, sent back to duty, reinstated as a Muslim chaplain to serve the U.S. military. After I was cleared, I took it upon myself to tender my resignation, to resign from the U.S. Army and leave. And in January of 2005, I received an honorable discharge in addition to a second U.S. Army Commendation Medal for exceptionally meritorious service. I was given praise and recognition when I left the military after having been accused of being a traitor to my own country. Many people have asked me, why did this happen to me? Why do I believe this happened to me? And I believe it happened for at least three reasons. One is that I am a Muslim. After 9-11, after September 11th, where in the United States we find that many Muslims have been swept up and wrongfully accused, thrown in prison. It made it very easy for people to target me because I was Muslim. When people in Guantanamo saw me down at this prison camp, praying, bowing and prostrating, they recognized that this was the way the Muslim prisoners prayed. When they saw me read the Holy Quran in the classical Arabic language, they recognized that this was how the prisoners prayed and read the Holy Quran. And to some few in Guantanamo, whether it was due to their ignorance or lack of knowledge, or even if it was due to their bigotry and hatred for Islam, it meant that I too was the enemy and they would come and target me. But I also believed that it happened in part because of my ethnicity, being Chinese. But it also happened because, without a doubt, I was raising concerns. I was objecting to the torture down in Guantanamo, to the abuse of the prisoners being held in Guantanamo, to the conditions, the animal-like conditions down in Guantanamo. I raised concerns at a time 
when much of the world knew nothing about what was going on inside this prison camp. Today, of course, much of what I talk about is public information. We know it, that these abuses have occurred down in Guantanamo. We know they're facts now. But at a time when this information was not out, people were scared that I would expose the transgressions that were happening in this place called Guantanamo Bay. My brothers and sisters in Islam, it was a harrowing time for me to be in prison and to be treated like a traitor to my own country. It was a harrowing time in Guantanamo to see how religion was being used as a weapon and how individuals in Guantanamo were being persecuted for their Muslim faith. But that's my story. That's my experience as an American citizen who converted to Islam and became a Muslim chaplain and served at this now notorious prison camp. I hope that I've shed some light, that I've given you information which causes you to rise up and to stand firmly for justice, to stand up for human rights. We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Kunu qawamina bil qist shuhada'a lillah that all oh, you who believe stand firmly for justice as a witness before Allah and as Muslims. We have to speak out against wrongdoing. We have to speak out against human rights abuses. And even for me as a Muslim, an American citizen, it meant speaking out against my own government. My brothers and sisters in Islam, my name is Brother James Yusuf Yee. I'm the former U.S. Army Muslim chaplain who served in Guantanamo Bay. And as I said when I started my talk, that I'm inspired when people come to listen to my story. Because I hope that it will cause those people to become stronger in their faith and stand up for human rights and justice. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, as I said when I started my talk, I'm inspired when people come to hear my story because it's my hope that all of those who hear it will they themselves become stronger in their faith to become better people to become individuals who will also ultimately stand up for human rights and justice my brothers and sisters in Islam much of what I've told you today is something that I've documented in a book that I had published in 2005 entitled for God and country. For God and country. Faith and patriotism under fire. And it chronicles my journey to Islam, how I became Muslim, and then how, as a Muslim, I grew to want to serve Muslims who were serving in the armed forces, and how that path led me to Guantanamo Bay, ultimately to object to the horrors that you heard in my story today. My friends, my brothers, my sisters in Islam, it's an ultimate pleasure and honor to be here today to be a part of this conference entitled Peace, the Solution for Humanity. Because without a doubt, our world needs peace. And it needs to be one that doesn't tolerate injustice and human rights. Jazakumullah khair. I'm your brother in Islam, Akhukum Fillah, James Yusuf Yee. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.